So are you able to hear me? And I know you can't turn your sound on, so if you could at least turn on your screen so I can see a head shake, that'd be great. Okay. Are you able to hear me? Okay, great, okay. So I will um, get things queued up then. Okay, I just was hoping to get a check back on, okay, you can see the presentation, perfect. Excellent, okay, well, I can get going then. Um, so today we're gonna to be talking about uh, conservation activity plans and the transition to the uh, conservation planning activities, design and implementation activities and um, conservation evaluation and monitoring activities. And so for those folks that have been and have worked with the conservation activity plans. Uh, what I'm gonna be going through today is a presentation on that change uh, from where we were with, with CAPS was kind of the standard name and uh, where we're at today with our new uh, options for providing uh, planning assistance and other types of assistance to NRCS customers. So with that said, um, I am Larry Johnson, I'm the State Conservation Engineer in Washington State for NRCS, and I'm also the Technical Service Provider Program Manager, and um, I've been in the state for coming up on 30 years now, so I've been here for quite some time. So the presentation I'm going to be going over today was one that was provided by our national office to basically internal NRCS, and I reformulated it uh, for the meeting here at Wade. And so hopefully it provides a, a good background of uh, the whole, you know, CAPS and why we were transitioning to this new um, conservation planning activities or these various activities we have available and why we're now on that path rather than still using the CAPS. So by the end of the presentation today, hopefully you're clear on that. And uh, at that point in time, once I've gone through the presentation, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about, about the program itself. So um, here's the agenda. I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of CAPS. Um, I'm gonna talk about a continuous process improvement that we went through at national office to evaluate the, uh, the whole CAP program, actually the technical service provider program and uh, what the results of that were and then talk about the transition need and the transition outcomes and conservation planning and program delivery, a list of available CPAs, DIAs, and SEMAs. And so we'll get in a lot more detail on that. And then kind of the future of um, 
the direction that we're currently heading in on the national level. And we'll finish up with a Q&A session. So just a little brief background on CAPS. Back during 2002, 2002 Farm Bill, uh, the Farm Bill authorized NRCS, actually the secretary, to develop and lead the technical service provider program. And uh, so we did that. The program has rolled out in 2003 to all states. And then in 2008, through the Food Conservation Energy Act, we added the capability to do CAPS. And so in 2009, CAPS were piloted in select states. And in 2010, 12 CAPS were identified and available for all states to utilize. And so what is a conservation activity plan? <clears throat> so a conservation activity plan is basically a plan that's developed for a producer to identify conservation practices and, and needs to address a specific natural resource need. And uh, the way that it was set up is that uh, conservation activity plans had to be developed by a certified technical service provider. And throughout that time, uh, from 2009 to present, um, actually 2001, uh, we've gone, kind of gone through sort of an evolution of updates and changes, pretty subtle mostly, uh, with the conservation activity plans over time, just kind of refining and making things better. And here's interesting graph as far as just sort of the amount of use that the various caps have had across the country <clears throat> between 2009 and 2019. And if you take a look at cap 106, which is forest management plan, um, across the country, we have certified 16,647 plans throughout that period of time. Uh, the second highest ranked one is for con comprehensive nutrient management plans. And across the country, we had certified 8,912. And then Ag EMPs, which are agricultural energy management plans, <clears throat> combining all of the, the three different ones that we've had, uh, we, we certified a total of 5,891. And then of course, the 104 nutrient management plans uh, at 1,985. And there's a lot of other caps that we have on, on our tech guide that we're able to use. <clears throat> um, the first, uh, uh, the last bar graph really gave an idea of those things that we spend a lot of time working on here in the state as well. Primarily looking at forest management plans, um, CNMPs, as well as uh, ag EMPs. But there's a lot more that we could have done in the state, but there wasn't an interest or a need depending upon what the cap was. So just kind of the big picture again, looking at the obligations of funding throughout 2009 and 2019. And this is across the country. So for cap 102s, which are CNMPs, NRCS has invested and spent two TSPs over five, $55 million. CAP 106s, which are forest management plans, we have spent 27 million plus for, for uh, forest management plans across the country. And then uh, CAP 128s, which are the Ag EMPs across the country, we spent 12, almost $13 million toward that activity. If you sum up all of the caps that we've provided assistance on across the country and funded, uh, we've spent $113 million uh, to develop conservation activity plans. Okay, so that, that actually that looks pretty good as far as uh, the, the number of plans that we've developed and the um, funds that we've spent toward that product. But uh, during that 11 year period of time, there were some, I wouldn't say complaints, but there were some bumps and issues that we were dealing with. Uh, 
nationally. And so there was a national effort to really dive into the current process to see if we can make things better or not. So we initiated a continuous process improvement uh, initiative. And through that process, we stood up 10 teams. And what I'm gonna be covering today in this presentation is the one related to CAPS and implementation. But there were eight other teams as well that had very active roles and really taking a look at how the uh, conservation activity plan process was working and how that fit into our overall technical service provider program. And so in March of uh, 2020, uh, the, C the CPI process was initiated. And in June 2020, sub teams were stood up to take a look at um, and really dissect everything that uh, we had available as far as the processes we used to operate the program. And so some of the accomplishments of, that ten of those teams were to identify current process maps, data collected was data or data was collected from states and develop future process states and recommendations for changes in policy training and NRCS registry and then presented the findings to our deputy chief for programs. They pulled in 56 participants from 23 states as well as some technical service providers as part of their team to take a look at the issues that were that we were seeing and to kind of ground truth those with the TSPs that we had as part of the work group. And what they did is they identified some common themes as far as problem areas. And some of the things, uh, probably the biggest one was leading to the inconsistency across state lines. And for a lot of technical service providers, they provide service um, you know, to multiple states. So that was somewhat of an issue. A lack of clear guidance and training for staff and for TSPs. No clear priorities for needed services. Quality assurance and accountability is difficult and not very effective. Ineffective communication between NRCS customers and TSPs. And difficult access to resources such as training and tracking software for TSPs. <clears throat> so kind of encapsulating those um, into general categories, conservation activity plans, basically, uh, what, what the key message here was is that TSPs to participants as well as NRCS staff were frustrated with inconsistent expectations, deliverables, and lost time. And then the end result was the customer is not getting a final product that met their needs. And uh, the role of our conservation, uh, our CPA 52, which is our environmental worksheet, they're also varied among states. And so that was a little bit, that was difficult for TSPs to really maintain consistency from state to state since each state had um, different requirements within the CPA 52 because it also included state requirements and each state has different rules and regulations. So that was challenging for TSPs. And the implementation requirements um, that we had identified as part of the CAPS, the expectations of the current CAP requirements and deliverables are not understood by the clients, TSPs, and even NRCS staff in some cases. Uh, that results in a lack of constant, uh, consistent communication between the client and TSP at the time of contract obligation and a lack of trust and understanding between the parties was created by these efficiencies in the delivery of the program. And uh, inconsistent support to TSPs at the state level was another uh, barrier that was identified. So because of all those things, a transition um, need was identified. <clears throat> with the primary goal of improving our customer service to our client. So essentially uh, uh, there's three, three major categories here that uh, were hit on through the transition. And the first one was really to align the technical uh, service provider program assistance with the NRCS assistance workflow. So kind of following the nine steps of planning. And the second one was consistent expected deliverables uh, from TSPs. Uh, so by having consistent deliverables and expectations from TSPs, irregardless of what state they worked in, um, we felt like that, that would increase product quality and address the inconsistency issue that we were uh, confronted with, as well as improve relations with TSPs, as well as our customers. And then, of course, congressional focus for NRCS to increase work with TSPs and other providers. And that's always been a push is, uh, you know, for those things that we can outsource, uh, and it makes good sense to do that. Let, let's try to do that. So the TSP 
program has allowed us to outsource certain activities. <clears throat> so the transition outcome. So for fiscal year 2022, which we're in, began uh, October 1 of 2021. So we're looking at our federal fiscal year. CAPS have been repackaged and organized into three types. So we have uh, conservation planning activities and the acronym is CPA. We also have design and implementation activities, which the acronym is DIAs. And then we have conservation evaluation and monitoring activities, which we call SEMAs or CEMA. And so for each of these activities, the document that we have, and it looks, it, it, it looks very similar to the, uh, if you're familiar with the old CAP documents like CAP 102 or 106, um, they had somewhat of a standardized process, but the, pro the, but the document has been actually standardized even more. And so we'll take a look at one of these uh, a little bit later on uh, in the presentation, but <clears throat> essentially it's set up with the four primary categories here with the definition of that activity, the criteria that that activity needs to meet, the deliverables, and the references that uh, support that particular activity. And so one of the other things was really to focus on the conservation assistance workflow. And so <clears throat> this looks a little confusing, but it really isn't. Uh, essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the NRCS workflow to start with. So NRCS, <clears throat> essentially, when we provide assistance to a producer, we will work through steps one through seven of the planning process to develop a conservation plan. Once that's completed, we move into step eight here, which is really to develop the design and specifications, as well as the implementation requirements for that particular uh, practice or activities that we're wanting to uh, accomplish on that producer's land. And then step nine is really the follow-up, really doing monitoring and evaluation, making sure the practice is functioning properly, as well as uh, um, you know seeing if there's any issues related to the practice as it was designed. Because sometimes, you know, we learn a lot from things that were installed as well <clears throat> that result in changes to our national practice standards. So that's the NRCS workflow. <clears throat> the goal here was to really have TSPs mimic that workflow as we transition to this uh, uh, activity um, process. So essentially, um, the conservation planning activities are covered through these activities that, that we call conservation planning. And, and basically those outline the first seven steps of the planning process. When we go to design and implementation activities, that is that essentially is step eight of the planning process, which is really looking at developing uh, designs, construction specifications, practice specifications for installation, as well as installing the practice. And then the third piece here, the third activity is the SEMA, which allows for uh, doing monitoring and evaluation of the installed conservation uh, measure. So there's separate lines as far as processes go, but the goal is the same, following the, the workflow process that NRCS is set up. So just as a quick refresher, I'm sure most folks know the nine steps of planning. Um, I just wanted to break this out in categories, showing you where the conservation planning activity uh, would fall as far as those things that we would be expecting for a CPA, um, as well as uh, the design and implementation activities, um, and then also the uh, CMAs, which is the uh, conservation evaluation and monitoring activities. So let's take a look at what conservation planning activities we actually have available. Um, so basically, some of these will look very familiar from what you've seen. And uh, the first one here is Com Comprehensive Nutrient Management Plan, CNMP. Uh, it was CAP 102, uh, and now it is CPA 102. Um, the actual document's been formatted as, as you know, I had kind of identified all these documents uh, uh, followed a very specific format. So it's been reformatted to really show the first seven steps of the planning process. Same thing with forest management, management that conservation planning activity uh, used to be CAP 106, now it's CPA 106. So 
So there's going to be a lot of crosswalking between what we had before with CAPS and what we have with our various activities. We also have soil health management with CPA 116 and CPA 138 is organic transition. And then they've added one, uh, CPA 199 for conservation plan. The second grouping of activities is design and implementation activities. And again, this follows step eight of the planning process. <clears throat> and again, you'll see some things here that probably look familiar from the old cap inventory list. And there's also some new ones. We have uh, comprehensive nutrient management plans. And this is actually for design and implementation activities. So it'll have different criteria in it than the CPA will. Um, it'll get into the design aspects and implementation aspects of that particular um, planning activity, and it'll provide some of the details as far as uh, you know what needs to be installed in order to address the resource concerns. We have agricultural energy design, which is uh, code 102 for DIA 102 is what we'll call it. We also have organic transition, which is a new one. We have DIA 144, which is fish and wildlife habitat. <clears throat> DIA 148, pollinator habitat. DIA 157, nutrient management, that is a new one. DIA 158, feed management. And then we have DIA 159, grazing management. And then 160 is prescribed burning. 161 is pest management. 162 is soil health. 163 is irrigation water management, 164 is drainage, drainage water management, and then 165 is forest management. And the ones that are not marked new actually had a conservation activity plan associated with it. So there should be some similarities as far as the general um, scope uh, of those things that we had in our tech guide before up to the end of fiscal year 2021. Um, so again, if you're familiar with those, they should still look somewhat familiar. And the last grouping are the conservation evaluation and monitoring activities called SEMAs. Um, these really include assessment monitoring and record keeping. And they're typically performed in step nine, but they don't necessarily have to be performed in step nine of the planning process. <clears throat> there are efforts underway to integrate additional SEMAs. Uh, for future use, I don't know what they're looking at, but uh, national office is eva always evaluating and seeing what other areas would be beneficial to uh, add, whether at different uh, codes, whether CPAs, DAAs, or SEMAs. So I expect over the next few years, we'll see kind of an evolution in what's available uh, for us to utilize as we're working with our customers. And kind of the last note here on SEMAs, um, they, they can be used at any stage of the planning process. They can also be used in the beginning um, to help develop a conservation plan. And a, a good example is uh, the work that we did with uh, agricultural uh, management plans, energy management plans, where you really need to have a good assessment of existing uh, conditions. Um, and it's really difficult to do that unless you have a qualified um, auditor out there really taking a look at the energy use and identifying those opportunities for improvement. So we can do SEMAs early in the process if that makes sense to do so. <clears throat> uh, they do require qualified individuals to complete the, uh, the work. And uh, this is a bit of a change from where we were before is for SEMAs, it does not require a certified TSP, but a TSP may be qualified based on the standard. So um, what that really means is that as long as we have an individual that's qualified to provide that assistance, um, they don't necessarily have to be a certified TSP in tech reg. And that, that's a pretty big change from where we were at before. Just the last note on transition outcomes, state supplements to the CPA, CIAs, and SEMAs are prohibited. We cannot make any adjustments. We can't take anything out or add anything in. Um, and that the goal for that is to really maintain consistency across the country in, in how TSPs use these. So when they work across state boundaries, they're, they are familiar and 
expert on the contents of those, of those activities. And secondly, um, as usual, this is with all work that we do, we're required to comply with all other federal, tribal, state, and local laws and regulations and permit requirements and meet the producer's objectives as well. So the activity documents are located on our national EQIP website, basically the same location where our CAPS were located. And then if you are more familiar with our state uh, tech guide location, there's a link when you, when you go down into the Washington State Tech Guide in section three, there's a section there for CPAs, DIAs, and SEMAs. And when you select that, it will take you to the, the National EQIP webpage, which is where the uh, documents are, are housed. So deliverables for these products, essentially two copies are required. One must go to the client and the other one to NRCS field office. And uh, if it's a hard copy, um, in either case, really the client is the owner of the document and should provide that to uh, NRCS directly rather than the TSB providing it to us. I'm just gonna go through the conservation planning and program delivery process that we use, just kind of give you a basic understanding of how we would use the uh, CPAs, the DIAs and SEMAs as part of our, uh, I guess our toolbox really in providing assistance. But essentially they're contained in our, our delivery system. So when we're working up a conservation plan, we can look at CPAs, DIAs, or SEMAs, as well as our just our conservation practices as part of a uh, conservation plan and rolling that forward uh, to identify specific activities that could resolve a resource issue or concern. I know you've seen this chart before, but what's important here is that we can kind of mix and match those activities between the two workflows that we have here. So, this was something that was difficult to do before, but let's say, for example, NRCS develops the conservation plan, but we want to have a TSP do the design and implementation activity. We, we can do that now. So what we could do is set up a contract with, with the producer to accomplish that DIA on our behalf. And so they would be responsible for developing the plans, the specs, uh, for the practice implementation, as well as the oversight on the implementation. And then uh, we could eat, then we would do the final check on that to make sure that um, it, it meets standards. But uh, as far as monitoring and evaluation after that fact, again, that, that, those are activities that we can also either decide to contract out with the producer or handle that internally within NRCS. So the conservation delivery system components, just kind of break it down in, into separate things. Here's the conservation plan for NRCS. That's kind of uh, our standard um, bread and butter as far as what we do. Um, we can contract out CPAs to TSP providers through the 100 series codes. And we already went through that list. We can also do DIAs uh, for for um, TSPs to handle the design and implementation activities of various practices, or we can handle that internally. Um, we can also design practices um, specifically uh, through the tools that we have, which is uh, something that um, the technical service providers, uh, we would not necessarily be looking at to take the lead on that. This would be like an NRCS led practice design activity. And then for evaluation and, and monitoring activities, again, that's something that we can do or we can contract out to a TSP. Really the key thing here is that we work kind of hand in hand with the, uh, the producer, uh, the participant, to determine what activities might, might meet their need. And then uh, we would make a decision on how we want to roll forward. If we, if we had the interest, ability, and staffing capacity to work directly with the producer, we may decide to handle the, the kind of the workflow path internally. Um, in some situations, we may be looking for help to do that. So we would be looking potentially at um, entering into an agreement with the, with the participant to handle the, the CPA and the DIA, or potentially the SEMA. So 
So through the NRCS contacting process, we can mix and match some of these. So we can do these things as a standalone. So we might want to, if you know where it makes sense, we might want to just have a CTA contracted or a DIA contracted or a SEMA. But we can also pair these up. So we can have uh, multiple contract items to either do a, a CPA, a, a DIA, or a SEMA. Um, what we cannot do is we cannot have all three of these uh, bunch together we have where we have a CPA, a DIA, and conservation practices. Um, those are things that cannot be uh, grouped together as a kind of a payment activity for a provider. And this is just a different way to look at it, kind of uh, looking at pairing the standalone process. And uh, basically, this is the activity. This is the, the uh, design and implementation requirements and then conservation practices and kind of the end result of you know, how we could do SEMAs. And, and then the pairing process as well, you know, we can mix and match those or do standalones for, for SEMAs. And then just kind of another chart showing that uh, pairing where you might have a CAP 102 CPA paired up with the design and implementation activity. Um, you might do the same thing with forest management where you have the uh, CPA uh, paired up with the DIA. <clears throat> or you, we can pair them up where we have um, a, uh, a design and implementation activity paired up with a specific practice. And then SEMAs can join contracts at any time. And in some cases, you know, you may want to have a SEMA in place at the same time that you do a, uh, a CPA. And ag EMPs is an area where that would probably make a lot of sense. So this is kind of an NRCS decision tree. And I assume that this is going to be available for you folks. I'm not going to go into this at all, but uh, there's kind of a decision tree on how NRCS would take a look at you know, whether or not we wanted to uh, pursue the CPA, the DIA, or the SEMAs as part of our uh, assistance to a producer. And so there's a decision tree that we have here that would kind of map that out. And NRCS is responsible for administrative reviews and completion of all conservation activities. So all the CPAs, the DIAs, and SEMAs we're responsible for administrative review and certifying, certifying and signing off on that. The practices installed from TSPs created, from TSP created uh, design and implementation activities require an employee, NRCS employee with JAA to assist with the application and checkout. So we're gonna dive in here a little bit and take a look a little bit closer at the uh, CPAs, the DIAs, and the SEMAs, as far as the ones we have available. So I've already kind of gone through the list. This is, uh, again, the list reformatted. So these are all the CPAs that are available for us to uh, work with a participant on if they're interested and we're interested in moving that direction. Here's a list of the design and implementation activities. And then lastly, the SEMAs that we have available. What I'd like to do now is go to our national webpage and just take a look at where these are housed. So this page is on our national website for the EQIP program. And uh, it's under the directory of fiscal year 2022, EQIP, CPAs, DIAs, and SEMAs. Gives a little bit of an overview of what they are. And then we have all of the activities in the table here below with a brief description of what they are. So I'm going to open up CAP 102 or CPA 102. Take a quick look at that. This one here is for Comprehensive Nutrient Management Plan. 
And again, um, I just want to bring your attention to the format where we have the definition, the criteria. We'll scroll back up here in a minute. The technical requirements, deliverables, and then the references. So each of the will be in that format. And then within those uh, categories, it will provide the specifics of what it is that we are asking the, the uh, provider to do. And this one here with the, uh, with the uh, CNMP, uh, basically it really maps out um, the, the seven step, first steps of the planning process. So um, it'll walk you through that. And as part of uh, work in this activity, uh, the, th the thing that the provider would need to do is address these specific um, planning topics. So I'll scroll down here, to the next one. And the technical requirements for 103 are listed here. And of course, each uh, CPA will have its own list of technical requirements. And the uh, provider that is using and applying those, these will have to have a good understanding of what all these various requirements um, are asking for and, and how they would go about delivering that. Some of this is running some of our uh, resource tools kind of our, our technical diagnostic tools to identify any kind of resource concerns that might be out there on their, on their um, lands. And then it also outlines deliverables, <clears throat> talking about two copies going to uh, the producer and one to NRCS. And then kind of breaks that down a little bit more detail as far as you know the format that we want to see the document in. Uh, with more details with cover page, which should be on it, the conservation assistance notes, maps, conservation plan, and then the references as well that we have for supporting this activity. Now let's look at the uh, DIA for this one as well. <clears throat> so this is the design and implementation activity for um, CPA 102, uh, but this is DIA 101. So it's kind of the, the eight, step eight of the planning process. <clears throat> And essentially, it outlines uh, the need for specific design and implementation activity for an AFO or uh, for by the products of an AFO that include components for structural and non-structural conservation practices, all to address the application of manure and nutrients, handling, transfer, storage, and treatment of animal waste. So again, it's in the same format. We've got the criteria section with general requirements. <clears throat> technical spec and specific requirements, the deliverables, and um, also the references. So again, the format's the same, but the details underneath each section are more specific to step eight of the planning process. I'm not gonna go through each um, of these. There's a, there's a bunch of them, but uh, if you're interested at all in seeing what we have there, you can certainly take a look at them. Um, I think probably the, the key message I wanna present here is that, you know, as we're, as we're working with a producer, we really take a look at, you know, how best to provide the service to that individual. And if, if we want to uh, utilize the um, uh, kind of the, we'll call it this activity aspect of, of the TSP program, we certainly can do that. And so where we have capacity, 
for folk, for our folks to do this, there probably wouldn't be a need, but there are certain activities and the ones that we've been contracting out as caps over the past, uh, you know, I'd say 10 years are really related to the, uh, the cap or the CNMP needs, the farm management plan needs, as well as the agricultural energy management plans. So those are kind of the three categories that I would foresee that we would still be looking at, you know, utilizing the, uh, the CPAs and the DIAs to help us in that area as well as the CMOs. So I hope, I hope that helps um, just a little bit on the future here. The CAP transition will continue to, will continue basically, our national office will continue to look at ways to update and make things better. They're always collecting feedback and making adjustments as needed. And then um, we're required to go back and revisit the continuous, continuous process improvement initiative that we went through just to see how things are going, if it's going the way that we had anticipated or not, and then to make any course corrections that seem to make sense. So with that, I will end my presentation and I'll stop sharing. And I'm not sure if, I know we had some um, feedback issues, so maybe questions would be uh, more related to the um, kind of the chat questions and since I think we're having troubles with the sound. Larry, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, how do you? How would you envision that um, conservation district staff could engage with any of those planning processes, or um, you know, would that be through task orders, or uh, what other options are there with JAA and things like that? So the way the way that I see this happening is that you know our, our local district conservationists or our resource conservationists work with the conservation district staff that are there to see, you know, if you have capacity to handle certain things on our behalf. And of course, there's a number of ways we can do that. We have used the commission task order to do that routinely. Um, this is kind of a different flavor. This would be a separate um, way of providing assistance to a producer that could hire um, a provider, it could be a you know conservation district, or it could be somebody else for that matter, to uh, provide that product that um, that we're asking them to basically have produced. Um, so we we can pay for that to the producer. So I guess the difference between um, like the task order process is that the money goes from NRCS to the commission to the district, whereas the money flow for um, for these activities goes from NRCS to the participant, the producer, or the landowner, and then to the provider. So the, uh, the the flow path of funding is is a little bit different. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see anything in chat. It looked like we had some trouble with uh, seeing the presentation. Hopefully you were able to see it. Well, we don't have any other questions here in the classroom, Larry. Um, okay. But thank you so much for your presentation. All right, hope it's helpful. Um, I know it was a lot of detail, but uh, I think it was important to kind of talk about where we were and where we're at today. And I do think there's definitely a place where you know, we would like to be able to rely on our conservation district partners locally to help with some of these activities. And so as we roll forward, and we're kind of learning on the fly here too, but as we roll forward, identifying those workload demands, we'll, you know, our, our DCs and RCs hopefully are talking with you about those needs. So I appreciate your time and uh, really enjoy just being able to present to this group. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Um, are you are you able to return me to the host? Oh yes, 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 yes. Sorry about that. At least I think I can. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try. I am not a Zoom expert, so I'm struggling here a little bit. Should be if you click on the three dots in the upper right corner of the Skagit CD tile. 
<coughs> okay. Should have a drop. Got it. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.